A routine question. Have you recently sold any war surplus submarines, and if so, to whom? The Wrestling Life. Hey everybody, it's The Wrestling Life, it's episode 303. It's the first week of June of 2022, I'm Ethan. And I'm Liam. Liam, we have so much to talk about. And, as always, so many things we can't talk about right here on the first and still the only wrestling podcast. We did about 25 minutes worth of show before the show. So hopefully we still have some wrestling things to talk about here. <laughs> um, there was a big AEW pay-per-view this past weekend. It feels like it was 500 years ago at this point. Mm-hmm. There are two WWE pay-per-views this weekend. Oh, right. The There's... NXT one. <laughs> yeah, that counts, I guess. <laughs> there is... Uh, there... Oh, like... oh, man. There's a uh, AEW New Japan joint pay-per-view at the end of this month. There's the finals of the best of the Super Juniors Friday morning. Dominion is next week in New Japan. There's 500 million things going on. I guess we should start with AEW. This is almost a week old at this point, but it became news again after Dynamite this week where MJF went all 2000 WCW on us. (laughs) So MJF threatened, it would appear to not show up at AEW's pay-per-view, then showed up at AEW's pay-per-view, and his real-life issues with AEW management have been turned into a storyline. Do you want to start with MJF, or do you want to just should, do you want to give thoughts I, on the pay-per-view first? I feel it's like MJF is the bigger deal, so oh, yeah, which I think can maybe tie into our pay-per-view thoughts in a minute here, but. Uh, yeah, no, M- MJF is by far the, I think, the biggest story in, in all of wrestling. If you're if you're somebody listening to this show or who keeps up with with that news, like, yeah, it was a it was a wild weekend that started with him no showing a meet and greet shoot, no showing from what we can tell. Uh, and then at some point during the weekend and again, maybe he he threatened to leave or maybe the no showing was just him, was just him, but then as soon as he no showed it, they decided at that moment to pretend he was going to get on a plane and fly out of Las Vegas and not do the match. Uh, depending on who you talk to, there was a plane ticket purchased and reserved in his name uh, for a flight he didn't end up getting on Saturday night or early Sunday morning. And then, by golly, he showed up. They Wardlow killed him, and. They did a stretcher job, which is the sort of thing you would do if someone was leaving your territory. Yep. Uh, and then he just walked out on dynamite, not selling the 25 power bombs and stretcher job he had done two days earlier. And yep. uh, did, as you said, straight out of a Vince Russo show. Uh, he's a heel, but he starts off by saying he's not in character this week. Every other mjf promo we've ever seen that's that was fake but this is real and uh he aired he aired his grievances which as you said and i'm sure is true are real things that he thinks and feels uh, or at least did at one point and and then he yelled and he got to use some naughty words and he got to throw in a lot of insider references about how he's He's trained unlike a lot of these other wrestlers. It's yeah, it's the same stuff that Dan Lambert says all the time, but I think he said yes. it so much it just doesn't it just falls on deaf ears at this point. But it's untrained cosplay wrestlers who don't know how to draw money and and all this stuff. And MJF's better than all of them, but he's not being paid like he is, and he hates it and he wants to leave. And then he calls Tony, says, "Fire me, you effing Mark," and then they cut his mic. And they go to a commercial, and I don't believe they addressed it on on screen. They tried to make you try to make it look like he went too far, and they cut his mic and went to a commercial. And then during the commercial, which in footage I don't think AEW has released and probably won't, Punk ran down to uh, to chase MJF off, and uh, and there we are. We're off to the races, and we're. We have our top heel in this company 
is cutting promos that are getting him cheered because he's talking about things uh, that certain people, both people that hate AEW say about AEW. And I think some people who are our fans or who generally like AEW still feel AEW, you know, some areas where AEW has fallen short um, specifically in bringing in ex WWE people. And so, which is, it's, it's funny because this was, from what we can tell, it was supposed to be a heel promo because AEW to this point has never tried to make the company a heel. Uh, and in fact, a few days earlier on a rampage show in, in Las Vegas, uh, they accidentally made Chris Statlander a giant baby face and Ruby Soho into a heel when Chris Statlander cut a very similar, she didn't complain about ex WWE people, but she talked about how she's been in this company since very early on and she doesn't have anything to show for it. And she wants to go on and win this tournament. And so when Ruby Soho beat her, the crowd booed Ruby, Ruby Soho vociferously. And then a few days later, a MJF, the top heel is doing a promo with very similar material and I guess we're supposed to boo him this time. I I can't answer that. I can't tell you what the logic is, if there is any, behind any of this. <laughs> and uh, we talked about this a little bit off the air, but my thing with AEW, and this is not like their creative often leaves something to be desired. I think that is fair and safe to say. Um, their angles often feel rushed. The, the creative is sometimes, especially I think for some of their women segments, very uninspired, but I, and I think a lot of people are a little bit more forgiving one, because the company has built up goodwill with its audience. And two, whether the storyline is working or clicking or not, generally everything on the show is in service of building to a wrestling match. What is yeah. the wrestling match that MJF cutting a promo about how Tony Khan is a mark and he hates wrestling there. And all of the ex WWE guys come here and get more chances than the AEW originals. What is the wrestling match that that leads to? Well, it's either Tony Khan versus MJF or, (laughs) or Tony Khan gets a representative and that representative wrestles MJF. Yeah, neither of those are ideal though are they like tony khan becoming an on-screen character <laughs> which he has claimed he has no interest in in being i'm not sure i believe that but i i know he said that um or yeah like okay and then you have so you have what you have cm punk stand up for the for for tony khan and the company i don't know that that gets the desired reaction because he is even though he very you know very dramatically left WWE and he is not someone that I would ever consider a WWE guy. He was still a guy who, you know, became most the most famous he had ever been in WWE. So it's like a former WWE guy is going to come out to defend the company from the heel getting cheered and pointing out how all these ex WWE guys come in and get, get treated better than the originals. Like, I don't know that that's leading to the desired reaction you want, if that's the idea. Do you think they know what the idea is? I don't. I, well, again, and this is why it feels very flying by the seat of your pants, because it felt like MJF's trying to be Brian Pillman and is trying to blur the lines and work the, the quote-unquote dirt sheets and work perhaps his fellow wrestlers and management and, and who knows exactly what he really wants or what's, what's, who's in on it or or who knows, but it, yeah, it just feels like a jumbled mess. And again, assuming they have an idea of a payoff, as you said, let's assume it's somebody comes out to defend Tony Khan against MJF. I just don't know that that makes sense. Unless the end of this is Tony Khan is an on-screen heel authority figure and MJF is your new top baby face. Well, I think they're going to try to recreate the CM Punk angle where CM Punk left WWE with the championship, which was in itself a recreation of CM Punk leaving Ring of Honor with the Ring of Honor championship. Mm -hmm. And I think they're going to do that with MJF. I think MJF's going to beat CM Punk for the title or 
something along those lines. And um, we're going to go into full work shoot mode. Yeah. And like, like I've, I've made my opinions on just my general distaste for work shoot stuff. Um, I, I think, again, I don't think it's unfair to, to blur the lines or it's always a bad idea to use real life unhappiness to, to fuel your, your, your promos or whatever. And it doesn't have, you, you don't, you can do a promo about how he feels underappreciated and, and overlooked, um, without him talking about, you know, dropping guys on their heads. Well, it's wrestling. Like, isn't that what you're trying to do? If we're pretending this is, you know, like there's never a point in like game of Thrones or a Marvel movie where the actor stops the scene and starts talking about how it's BS that he has to lose this fight in the next scene or whatever. Like it's like there are behind the scenes and fun documentaries and stuff that go into the interworkings of stuff. But as far as when we're watching the, the live product on TBS every week, I don't really need people just, screaming wrestling's fake to me i think that's totally fair i think there's a lot of people that are and were wowed by mjf's promo on wednesday and are like this is so cool and it was such a great promo and they're so wowed by that they haven't thought through all the machinations of this (laughs) And mm-hmm. I think, and and where it leads, and uh, none of it leads to anything good. <laughs> <laughs> MJF is a baby face. I mean, he'll be a baby face for about fifteen minutes. Yeah, you know, until until he's like forty five years old, which is a long way away. Still, uh, 20, 18, 20 years away. Still, <laughs> it's like at that point. You know, you, you get old and you've been a, a respected heel for so long. It's like eventually you're going to be a baby face anyway. But I, I don't think that guy should ever be a baby face <laughs> until until then. Yeah, I mean, not I don't, you know, probably intentionally so and in people that he's patterned himself after. But he's always reminded me of Jericho in that in that regard is that Jericho's if you look at like the amount of time Chris Jericho post turning heel on Nitro in 1996 or whatever, like the amount of time he would be a baby face on television throughout like his entire WWE run generally pretty short. Um, and uh, until he got to a point where he was kind of a nostalgia act. And then even then he would try to change everything up to get himself booed again. We see that still to this day in, in the same company MJF works for. So yeah, I wouldn't be looking to do things that are going to get MJF cheered. And again, I genuinely think they didn't think people would cheer him for what he was complaining about. But again, whether you are someone that doesn't like AEW or in the case, I don't think the people that paid to, you know, pack that arena last night were people that, you know, hate AEW. Like, I think those are people that love AEW. And then he said something that went and they went, Oh yeah, it is. It is kind of screwed up that all these ex WWE guys come and come in here and take the spot. It's the same thing as you said, which I guess is what they're trying to recreate of CM Punk talking about John Cena and Dwayne Johnson taking his spot, uh, you know, 10, 10 years ago. So, which again, WWE thought that was a heel promo too. <laughs> like WWE thought the pipe bomb was a heel promo too. And it wasn't. So I guess I just, I got to see what it's, it's early enough that I think they can still course correct this, but you need to lay off and MJF can't be the one hitting the lines about, you know, X WWE guys taking AEW original spots because that those lines will get him cheered. Yeah. So the double or nothing pay per view counting the buy in was a like a five hour and ten minute show. What did you think of that? Uh, too long. Hot take. Uh, yeah, it was. Uh, a very long show, uh, anecdotal personal story, but I, I uh, usually for AEW shows go up to my buddy's house in, uh, in the, the backwoods of Pennsylvania and we watch these shows. And when it got to be about, uh, you know, 10 o'clock, he looked over at me and said, there are seven matches left. <laughs> and I said, oh, no. <laughs> 
And uh, <laughs> I did, you know, we stuck it out, watched the whole show through. I drove home in the middle of the G darn night and, uh, and everything was fine. But, and I will say, I think this is a rare AEW show that did get like a second win. Usually it's like it hits a peak and then it just drops and drops and drops until the end. This one was like the early stuff was kind of, you know, the crowd was hot. And then I feel like the Owen tournament stuff was the crowd started to taper off and the women's match and whatever. And then they hit that uh, the, the anarchy in the arena thing and the crowd woke up and it felt like there was life in the show. I think for the rest of it. So like it, it did, it is a rare AEW show that maybe actually peaked with some of the best stuff, but at the same time, it was still a five and a half hour show or whatever. And that is just unacceptable. No matter, you know, how, how Tony Khan tried to justify that in the, uh, the post-show uh, media scrum, which went to like, it was like 3 AM by the time that thing was over. It, it was well past that. <laughs> it didn't start till almost an hour after the show. And then it went for over two hours. Oof. Uh, um, I walked. Well, this is. I saw somebody on Twitter one time say that there's nothing that uh, people who work for wrestling websites like more than to complain about having to watch wrestling. <laughs> <laughs> but. I sure do. I sure do a lot of that, despite the fact that it's like the greatest job you could ever possibly I have want had wanted for 20 years and finally got. And it's like, man. Anyway, so I walked the dog. I, I after the show ended, I went and I walked. Uh, I walked Archie for 78 minutes and I was able to watch most of the scrum while we were out walking uh, on my phone. Um, but um it had already the scrum had already started when we left and it was still going on when we got back after a 78 minute walk like <laughs> what what are we doing here and tony khan is all geeked up and cutting promos on eric bischoff and swearing and <laughs> like what are we doing man what are we doing i think wild thing uh, deserves the credit for saving that show Fair. um <laughs> To your point, yes, it was anarchy in the arena, but it was to me the fact that the Wild Thing song played for like 10 straight minutes. I think I think just the novelty of that and the energy of that song um, uh, saved the crowd. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right, because there is a point when the song finishes and they've been brawling for a few minutes, you can hear the crowds kind of start to boo and then the song yeah. starts over and everyone just loses their minds. And it was very yes. fun. And that match was very wacky and, and wild. And, you know, it's it's a bit of a throwback to like, it's a mix of like, I guess, like modern, more modern hardcore stuff and ECW stuff. But also like, there's like WCW shows from the mid 90s where it's like the Nasty Boys and Harlem Heat. And they're just fighting in the crowd and throwing hot dogs at each other and stuff. So there's like some of that mixed into like it was a real wacky uh, smorgasbord of stuff. And then, yes, the the musical backing to to it definitely, uh, definitely enhanced it and and definitely kept the crowd invested for the rest of the show. It made me think, actually, are we going to see like, should we just have backing tracks (laughs) for for matches? I don't I don't hate that idea. <laughs> you know, like, like I think maybe it should be explored. Like, well, you know, at a baseball game between between pitches, they'll like play a sound sound effect or or track. Honestly, I can't believe WWE hasn't done more of this now that I've now that I've put it out into the ether. Like when they gave Braun the choo-choo noise <laughs> for his little run around the ring, the best three weeks of my life. Um oh, I can't believe they got rid of that. <laughs> it's the best. It was the G darn fest, but yeah, like you could, you could put in music or yeah, there's a, there's a lull in the match. The heel, the heel has uh, somebody in a chin lock. Yeah. And especially if it's Moxley or somebody that has a song, everybody likes, you just start the song up and then he starts making his comeback. That's like, I think that's a, that's a venue that should be explored. Yeah. I'm not like saying we should definitely do it, but I would like to see it tried a few more times and see if it's, see if it works. I, I like that idea better than I like the idea of cinematic matches at this point, just because I think 
the pandemic killed the cinematic match. <laughs> Yeah, I don't need to uh, ever see any anything on in that uh, in that ballpark again. So yeah, I, I'm I'm up for doing wacky things, especially if you're doing this crazy hardcore walk and brawl stunt stuff in the middle of a six hour show. So CM Punk's a wrestling world champion again. That's right. It's uh, he's I think he's uh, number two on the list of people who should be most uh, annoyed slash angry at uh, MJF and Tony Khan, I think. In what way? Because uh, he won the world championship, and then by the Wednesday, everyone's just talking about MJF. Like, I don't feel like... I don't feel like it feels like as big a deal <laughs> as you would think CM Punk winning the world title for the first time in a decade would. And arguably nothing on, on either of these shows did because of the MJF stuff. So I feel like that was a little overshadowed. Also, he should be mad at Tony Khan because they made them go out there and wrestle after five and a half hours of other stuff. And uh, that's too long of a show. But they did have a very good match and the crowd was into it and they reacted really strong to him winning the world title and everything. So he had a, he had a you know, it was a good night. The, the, the stumble on the, on the him attempting the buckshot notwithstanding. And, yeah. uh, and then his he had some uh, some issues in his match on Dynamite as well. So I mean, he's you know a good reminder occasionally. One, he was never a particularly uh, gifted natural athlete, and yeah. two, he's forty four years old or whatever he is. Yeah, yeah. I the more I see of him in the ring, the um, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Like positive, I don't know, or negative, I don't know. <laughs> like negative, I don't know. Okay. Like I think a lot of mileage on that guy. Maybe he should just cut out all the springboards and and uh, and just totally become an FTR <laughs> bald FTR uh, <laughs> wrestler at this point. Yeah, I don't think that would. I don't think people would be upset at the end of a CM Punk match if if they liked the match, but it's like, ah, oh, he didn't hit his, his springboard clothesline. You know, I think that's, I don't think that's even, I mean, it's, it's one of his moves. I know that, but like, it's not, it's not up the top of the list of moves where if you, if you didn't do it in your big pay-per-view title match that I think people would be like, oh, that was weird that he didn't do that. Maybe the flying elbow still needs to be worked in occasionally, but maybe the springboards don't need to, you know, don't need to be done too often. Yeah. So a um, lot of really, uh, ugh, they're going to 400 million different directions. They're promoting 500 <laughs> shows at once. That's what they do. It's what they do. They have, uh, they appeared to announce uh, Hiroshi Tanahashi versus CM Punk for the joint pay-per-view at the end of this month, but they, for some reason, didn't officially announce it. Uh, they poor Tanahashi. Like, I guess he's in Los Angeles anyway right now, but they brought him to the show and just ran him out there and didn't even officially announce his match for the end of the month. So, I mean, but, Punk said, who am I facing at Forbidden Door? And then he came out. So I think they didn't, to your point, what we just talked about on our, la- on our last show, they didn't air a graphic. The announcers didn't categorically say, this is the main event of that show in, in four weeks. The announcers put over Tanahashi as a big star and, it's you know it's a big deal and that he must have made an impression because Jim Ross remembers him from his, his years of commentating on archival New Japan matches that he watched. Jim Ross loves to bring up the fact that he called like three dozen New Japan matches on tape <laughs> delay. <laughs> <laughs> Any opportunity he gets, mm-hmm. and, uh, and he went drinking with Okada once or twice and likes to likes to bring that up also. Um, but yeah, um, speaking of old guys who, uh, are, are past, should, <laughs> probably maybe shouldn't be on a wrestling show anymore. Uh, yeah. uh, the Hardy, the Hardy men, Ugh. Matt and Nick Jackson, I think based on their, their, uh, their influence on the business, uh, alone are probably up way up the list of all time. Great tag teams watching yeah. them bump and sell and just give their all to drag 
Matt and Jeff Hardy to a really good pay-per-view match. I think they're like in the top three of all time after that performance. Cause my God, the Hardy men did not look good in that match. They sure didn't. I would put, um, well, you got to put the rock and roll express up there because mm-hmm. of their influence. You probably got to put the Hardys up there because their influence. Mm-hmm. And then, and that's probably the young bucks, uh, at least in my lifetime. Mm-hmm. I would say those are the three, but, um, yeah, so that match happened at double or nothing, and um, it was not a good night for the Hardys. Matt doesn't wrestle much anymore anyway, and at one point his pelvis had become fused to his spine, um, so he's got a lot of physical problems. And Jeff, I, you were explaining to me that he, Matt had detailed Jeff's, Jeff's injuries. Jeff got hurt sometime in a match recently, and then hurt again in another match. He got hurt against Bob fish and then he got hurt against Darby Allen. Mm-hmm. And then he got like kicked in the head or kneed in the head in the young bucks match on Sunday. And then did 15 Swanton bombs onto the steel steps. and was probably not feeling great anyway, but Jeff also, um, I think high fived every fan of the building on the way to the ring. And then after the match, he immediately took off through the crowd before somebody talked to him into going back to the ring. It was a vintage Jeff Hardy performance on Sunday in many ways. <laughs> yeah. Um, hope everything's okay there. As, you know, as far as his, his sobriety and everything goes. Oh, yeah. I don't like to cast aspersions, but I think it's, it's an educated uh, opinion to have that when <laughs> Jeff Hardy starts doing Jeff Hardy stuff. It's like if you ever watch like late WWF run Kerry Von Erich Oof. and you just like lights are on and nobody's home. But like not in the way of like Kurt Angle or Mick Foley, where they just got hit in the head so much. It's like you right. get worried where you're like, oh no, they're like they're they're all gassed up now. It's they're not, messed up. Yeah. Right. It's not, and so hopefully that's not the case with Jeff. And he was just banged up and maybe knocked a little loopy from the again the the kick or whatever that happened in that match. Um, I mean, he was on dynamite, he didn't wrestle. And uh, I guess hopefully they they get some time off. I mean, it was weird because based on the finish, which was the Hardys winning, you would think, you know, and they've talked about wanting to be the tag champions. You would think they'd be wanting to set that up before too long. But I would say, like, send the Hardys home for like two months. Matt and Nick can win the tag titles. And then you could maybe in the September show, bring the Hardys back then after they've had a few months to rest up and, and you can do the match with the idea that the Hardys should have a title shot because they own a victory over the tag champs. But in the immediate, I don't think either of these Hardy boys, but especially probably Jeff should be, uh, should be wrestling on TV. Well, you brought up to me also that in addition to Jeff wrestling on practically every dynamite since he's gotten there, they're doing the Hardy Boys reunion tour on the Indies every weekend. Mm-hmm. Yes, on uh, on Jer- so they were on Jericho's podcast this week, which I don't know why, but I listened to it, and not every week, but I listened to this one. Um, and Fair like d- during during the episode, they're talking about this, and 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 J- they were going over Jeff's litany of injuries. He hurt his ankle in the Bobby Fish match, blah blah blah. And then he and he's like, and on top of that, Matt's working me to death on these weekend shows. <laughs> And it, it was like one of those things where it's like, oh, we're kind of laughing, but also he's like, you're overbooking me a little bit, pal. Like, and Matt's like, yeah. oh, I'm just trying to make us some money. You know, we're trying to make some money quick or something like that. So it's like, you know, it's just so it feels like, the, yeah, they've been work. They have been working. It's not they're not just doing meet and greets, which I'm sure just being on an airplane for X amount of hours could could be you know rough for your health if you're a certain age. But on top of that you know, doing the meet and greets and stuff and then wrestling on top of it. And then, Oh, fly home for a day and then fly out to TV and, you know, fly home for a couple of days and then fly out to TV and Oh, you're wrestling. <laughs> you're wrestling again this week, Jeff. It's like, yeah, it's, yeah. that's a, that is a recipe for, uh, for quick and, uh, and frequent injury. I would imagine for someone of Jeff Hardy's age and uh, career path the best place for Jeff would be WWE if they didn't do house shows or if he didn't have to work house shows just because Mm -hmm. he could go do a slow pace match once a week, once every two weeks 
and be totally fine. Because like to me, that pay per view was the first time where it was like Jeff Hardy ever looked like totally washed up to me. It's like mm-hmm. he has slowed down over the years and what have you, but it was never like that was the first time I was ever like, uh, I don't think Jeff should be doing this anymore. And it wasn't even the whole match. Like some of the Swanton bombs onto the steps were great, <laughs> mm-hmm. but also why is he, why is he doing that to himself? Yeah. Anyway, I wouldn't have done that swan time on the steps. Like, I guess this time he actually hit it. He hit uh, Matt or whoever it was with it, but yeah, well, and he missed the one against Darby. But yeah, I wouldn't do that in the Darby match just to do it again two weeks later because I don't feel like it got as big of a reaction as if it was the first time he had done it. But yeah. you know, Jeff, Jeff, Jeff is Jeff, so that's that's what you do, and you're it's a Jeff Hardy match. And one final note on on that on that Jericho podcast. I'm gonna make it. <laughs> I'm going to make my time listening because that <laughs> means something here. Jeff mentioned sure. very offhandedly that he thought he was going to work with Roman Reigns after WrestleMania if he had stayed. So I don't know if that's like ex- huh. mildly explains why they had just nobody ready for Roman after uh, after Mania. But if if they were originally earmarking him to work Jeff Hardy at the, the show, he ended up working a six man at. But uh, I, was, I was like, oh, that's an interesting note. Like, because that's that would be a match I would do if I employed Jeff Hardy because people love Jeff Hardy and they would get behind him, even if they didn't really believe he was going to beat Roman Reigns. But it's also just not the way WWE has pushed Jeff Hardy, especially since, you know, 2017 to when he quit. So it's like, Oh, that's an interesting thing. I wonder if that's just him talking or if somebody told him that the timeline made me feel like it was something somebody told him though. He, he was gone like in the first week of January, though. They had three months <laughs> to get somebody else ready. That's true. And to, and to your point, they used him as a jobber the last year he was there. After mm-hmm. Matt went to AEW, they totally jobbed him out. So I tend not to believe that. It's possible someone told him that. Maybe Michael Hayes told him that. Michael Hayes likes to tell people a lot of things. <laughs> it's just. I just I I don't buy that, but yeah, maybe who knows? It's WWE. Anything is possible. Uh, any anything else on AEW before we move on to uh, WWE stuff here? No, I I guess we won't because it's a New Japan joint show. That we have to wait until at least I guess Dominion is over before we find out. Like, is Okada on the show? Is he defending the title on the show? Like, I guess Dave Meltzer had said that he was going to wrestle Hangman, but then took that back later on Thursday afternoon. So like, I would assume since if punk's defending the AEW title against the new Japan guy, I would assume Okada is then going to defend the IWGP title against uh, an AEW guy. And hangman would probably be the logical choice in that he's a guy that you can beat because he's no longer your world champion, but also it wouldn't hurt him to lose to, you know, the greatest wrestler who's ever lived either. So that would may a uh, match to make sense, but it's like we're at this point we're we're going to be like barely two weeks out and just just finding out what I think most of the show is going to be, at least from from the New Japan side. Yeah, I think it's going to be two big matches, and then like a bunch of uh, and then one of the matches will be Punk Tanahashi, and one of them will be Okada somebody, and it may end up being Paige. Who knows? Who was not on the Dynamite <laughs> this week? Mm-mm. Page wasn't uh, Thunder Rosa wasn't which I don't Thunder know Rosa how... was sick and okay. got sent home. I'm not sure if that means COVID or not, but she was sent home by the doctor. I see. Um, yeah, so there was uh, oh uh, Athena and Stokely Hathaway debuted. That's worth talking about, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's one of those things where if you're if your belief is that the AEW women's division needs more people who are more women who are experienced in wrestling on live television athena is someone i would definitely bring in um that may not matter if she is wrestling on on youtube or 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 rampage as much but that's someone i would certainly bring in if i wanted if i had people like you know anna j and whoever that i i thought could could be really good, but need need more seasoning and need smart people to work with. She's someone I would bring in. The Anna J 
Jade Cargill match and the Britt Baker Ruby Soho matches at the pay per view were definitely billboards for we need experienced people to work with our <laughs> inexperienced people. By the way, I heard that Bald FTR was the agent for Ruby Soho and Britt Baker. That makes sense to me. And if I were Ruby Soho, I would be agenting bald FTR's matches, not <laughs> vice versa. But well, I f- I, I, fig- I figured it was bald FTR because they did the Brett Noah finish. Oh yeah, they did, and no one no one noticed. <laughs> no, well, to be fair, I don't. I it would be weird to call it, it's oh, Jim Ross. I'm surprised Jim Ross didn't call it out, other than that he doesn't remember. I assume. Because he does love to call, call out when Dax takes bumps like Bret Hart, even though I'm not sure exactly what that means in the context of, again, of a of a fake wrestling show. But I digress. Right. Jim, Jim probably never saw WrestleMania uh, 10. Was, it, was he, in, he was in the company by then, wasn't he? Or was that during one of the times he was fired? He may have already been. He was. I think he was definitely demoted already at that point. OK, but I do don't know if he had been fi- if that was one of his firings or not. There's like a phantom firing that I never remember, and it might be that one. But okay, yeah, fascinating. But, uh, <laughs> fascinating he was, topics. I know he was not on the call for WrestleMania 10. I can't remember yeah. for the life of me who was at this point. Were he and Gorilla doing the radio version that year? That's possible. That is quite possible. I wish they would. Free- I would listen to radio over watching these shows. <laughs> Honestly, I mean, I would just put it up as like they must have the audio, I would assume like that should be on the on the network. WrestleMania nine and ten or however many they did where they had a radio broadcast. Yeah, you would think that those would have surfaced at some point in the last 30 years if anyone had them, though, right? Oh, maybe I mean, yeah. even on like. Yeah, I feel like radio is like kind of like the way the TV stations were in the 80s as far as keeping their stuff. They weren't very good at it. <laughs> they were like <laughs> tape over it and whatever. Mm-hmm. Anyway, uh, now we've, t- we've talked about Radio WWF here, so that's <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> uh, there's, yeah. How, f- oh, I would be so insulted if I were Ruby Soho and bald FTR was trying to tell me how to wrestle. <laughs> I mean, he came, I mean, they, I mean, I know Ruby, Ruby wrestled more places than he did as far as and then they both came through the nxt wwe system so like i don't i don't feel like experience wise he is such a great mind that i would be like yeah all right i'll i'll uh i'll take that it's like when they have like they had like uh older daivari <laughs> agenting and i'm just imagining ricochet being like all right Mid uh, 2007 WWE uh, undercard heel is telling me how to put my match together. Cool. Cool. This is awesome. The entire cast of characters they have there putting matches together in WWE. They have Kenny Dykstra, <laughs> Curtis Axel, uh, uh, Hurricane. Hurricane's mm-hmm. probably the best worker out of all of those guys. Chris Abyss. <laughs> uh, I can't remember. TJ Wilson. Well. TJ Wilson, TJ, like, at least has been like wrestling on trampolines since he was 13 years right. old. And he's something of a savant as far as like wrestling history. And I, he seems like a guy that like you go to when your match needs a finish, even if you're an experienced sure. worker as well. Well, he has no interests or personal life outside of wrestling. <laughs> so he, that's all he's done for the last 30 years is watch wrestling. So, sure. yeah, to your point. Yeah. But yeah, for anybody, ugh. Found FTR are very good at what they do, I think. Uh, <laughs> so people keep telling me, yes, but um, I man, I would be so insulted. <laughs> Gosh, yeah, but uh, anyway, Athena and Sto- Stokely Hathaway, Sto- Stokely's a much better fit with Jade than uh, uh Mark Sterling, who uh, mm-hmm. clearly had never spoken to Jade off camera before, <laughs> so there's that. I, did, I think, yeah, I think we had talked about it. It's like, do you think those people have ever spoken when the camera wasn't rolling? And I nope. don't, I don't think so. <laughs> nope. Oh. Have they ever let Kira Hogan say two words on television? I don't think so. I don't think I've ever heard her speak. No, Red Velvet's definitely. I've heard Red Velvet speak before. I've heard Jade speak. Yeah. I've heard Mark Sterling speak. I don't think Kira Hogan's ever said anything. 
Yeah, I don't think they ever really have explained who she is either or how they became the baddies, but that's okay. No, I mean, now it's fine. Uh, <laughs> one, one last AEW notes. <laughs> sure, why uh, not? Number one, I, I teased this earlier in the show. Number one guy who should be upset at MJF and Tony Khan is Wardlow because oh, this oh, is yeah. a two-year culmination of a storyline. Crowd was all hot and bothered by Wardlow for the last few months. We had reached the zenith. And then the match is all about MJF. And then on Wednesday, MJF is once again the focal point, And he wrestles J.D. Drake and then beats up some security guys. And it's like, he should have been TNT champion by 8.03 p.m. If, if I were booking this show, he would have opened the show and killed Scorpio Sky and took that belt. And that would have been the end of that. And he'd be, and we'd be off to the races. Like I think, and this is not a new thing, but I think a lot of times AEW will have, we saw that with Hangman, with Thunder Rosa, speaking of which, where you get the big win and everybody's super jazzed. And then the follow-up is either not what people wanted or it's just not that interesting and or non-existent in some cases. So yeah, Wardlow should be just real, real grumpy right now if I were him. I think I think that's fair. I think that's fair. He um yeah, he surely to people okay. So Britt Baker should be the AEW women's champion, Adam Cole should be the AEW men's champion, Wardlow should be the TNT champion. As far as like who gets the most TV time, who gets pushed, et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. But it, it everybody's just like it. <sighs> There's, I don't know, but they have a, a, a very good vision. I don't, I don't think they're real good at keeping things too cohesive over there. Well, and again, I think, I think they do. They're good at the, the, the build up a lot of times, you know, the hangman Kenny thing, the Wardlow and JF thing, like these long-term programs, it's great. And it comes to this crescendo, or at least it should have again, the NJF stuff overshadowed Wardlow's big moment. But then it's like the next week. It's like, that's the thing. It's a 52 week business, brother. You got to get back on the horse the next day. And it's just like, it felt like, well, we should have Wardlow on the show because he, you know, he, it's his first night as an official AEW wrestler or whatever. But he did not feel like, you know, half the star he did a week ago to me. Sure. So MJF put Wardlow over at the pay per view. Um, Britt Baker won at the pay-per-view and then lost in a tag match to Tony Storm and Ruby Soho <laughs> on TV this week. So it really feels like MJF and Britt Baker at least have uh, they've uh, they've mastered the WWE way of doing things already. That's right. Neither neither one of them's been through NXT, but you you I it certainly feels like they've studied the career of Paul Levesque. <laughs> By Winning the big match that people will remember and then not putting them over, right? Or right. And then if you if you if you must lose, lose in a tag match, no one will remember, and then beat them up afterwards. Yeah. Yeah, that's totally that's totally fine. Um, I think I'm the only one who watches NXT um under the age of 60. <laughs> um, so I'll just go through real quick this show that's coming up on Saturday. Uh, and every week on that show, they either um, they throw some kind of spaghetti or silly string. Uh, this is not like a euphemism for anything. They literally they literally throw spaghetti or silly string or dump a sack of balls on Mandy Rose for some reason uh, <laughs> on that show. Or there's, you know, Jeff Jarrett got rehired and all of a sudden women are barefoot on every WBF show again, which is. Weird. <laughs> he's anyway. back baby yeah double j is back uh, he got personally fired by vince mcmahon on live television and now he's an executive in the company mm-hmm. what a, that like no offense like i don't care about a vince mcmahon movie <laughs> yeah i want to show our movie maybe yeah like a, a 10 you could probably do 10 seasons of a television show some hbo prestige drama on the life and career of jeff jarrett and all of his <laughs> All the times he's been fired and then brought back to run a company that wanted nothing to do with him only years prior. It's amazing. An amazing man. Yep, it sure is. 
He sure is living off Kurt Angle's money. <laughs> Poor guy. Poor Kurt. Kurt just had both his knees replaced at the same time. Mm-hmm. Ugh. Oh. So this NXT show on Saturday has six matches. Five of them are title matches. Uh, Braun Breaker's wrestling Joe Gacy for the singles title. The NXT championship. If Braun gets DQ'd, he loses the title. So they're trying to tell the story that Braun Breaker has a bad temper and Joe Gacy, who's now a cross between The Undertaker 1998 and uh, The Fiend 2017 or 2019, and uh, all WWE supernatural garbage. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, is uh, doing things to provoke Braun Breaker's temper. Um, so that's the story there. It's not very good, but it's fine. Mandy Rose defending the Women's Championship against Wendy Chu. Don't like Wendy Chu's chances there. Uh, Gigi Dolan, JC Jane defending the Women's Tag Titles against the former uh, Casey Catanzaro, now Katana Chance. My hero. <laughs> that... best, per- best promo in the business. <laughs> that's right. There is, I have watched the, whatever the first promo was where she announced her new name. I have watched that like a thousand times and I'm barely exaggerating when I say that. Like I've never seen a, and and it's, it's a pre, it's not like this happened live on the show. This was like a pre tape for YouTube or something. And it's just like, nobody watched that and went, no, you have to, you sound like a weird robot alien person. You have to retake this and talk like a normal person. (laughs) Talk like a normal human woman, please. Like nobody, (laughs) no, no. nobody told her that. So she cuts this promo about how she likes to shoot back straight whiskey and loves to party or whatever. And that's why she's changing her name to Katana Chance. It's amazing. It's, it's one of the best wrestling things produced all year. Oh, without a doubt and she yeah and was like like hinted that she had a relation a uh, romantic relationship with her tag team partner which is not canon as far as i know but maybe she was trying to make it canon hey it's pride month i'm not judging i'm just <laughs> saying um that's not can excuse me that's not canon um yeah so that that tag match is happening uh pretty deadly my new favorite tag team are yes, defending, boy. yes boy are defending the nxt tag titles against the Cree brothers pretty deadly are our fantastic act it's a little bit speaking of pride month it's a little bit of a homophobic 1980s act in mm. that like the thing is that these guys they love each other they love themselves and like the heat and their heels. And so the heat is supposed to like, if you're a straight dude, it's supposed to make you cringe or something like it's, Mm -hmm. it's very outdated. But if you just take them for the entertainment value, they're my new favorite tag team. It's tremendous. And they're tremendous at the, at the things and like making it work in spite of the idea, but the heat is supposed to be homophobia. (laughs) Right. That makes sense. Yeah, I, I've only seen a few snippets, but you sent me one like 30 second promo <laughs> they did. And I was like, these guys should be like, they should be the universal. One of them should be the universal champion and the other one should be the WWE champion. Like these guys are wonderful. <laughs> they they are. They would be right at Vince's alley. Like he, he would. They they're they're really great. They're they're funny. They're good workers. It's great. Uh, Cameron Grimes defending the NXT North America title against Carmelo Hayes and then a six man tag with the uh, uh, bad Robert Nero impersonator Tony D'Angelo and his mafia characters against uh, 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 Santos Escobar and his legado del Fantasma family. The losing team has to join the winning team stable. so well, somebody realized wait we can't have two mafia things <laughs> so we're gonna I combine su- it into one mafia thing <laughs> i suppose i don't know these guys they they have a, a sit down meeting every, every other week on nxt but to try to hash out their differences <laughs> like vince finally started watching the sopranos that's what happened <laughs> how many times do you say the f word in the soprano <laughs> <laughs> All yeah, time i don't know great. about that and then uh, Hell in a Cell is also it. So that's a show that only I will be watching on Saturday night. And then uh, speaking of, of great w- things produced for WWE Digital, 
uh, Kevin Owens, Becky Lynch, Sarah Schreiber, <laughs> and Kevin Patrick. Uh, I think that's his name. Yeah. They, uh, they did some fantastic work on Monday after Raw. Just fantastic. Raw talk, I have never watched. Um, just <sighs> Kevin Owens and Becky Lynch. It's like they're both heels. But for whatever reason, on Monday, they were just feeling creative and are so naturally wonderful and likable <laughs> that, that they made magic. <laughs> Um, and a couple of promos that that they did for Raw Talk on Monday, just tremendous. Kevin Owens is really uh, to your uh, you brought this up to me. Kevin Owens has really tapped into something on this run. Yeah, he's it's and a lot of that uh, we've talked about this I think over over the years. I don't know if we talked about it on this show, but like sometimes you hit a, t- a point, like Dave Batista hit this point in 2010, <laughs> yes, where you just don't care. You don't care what they do with you. You're just going to go out there and try to make, make it fun and try to be entertaining and try to entertain yourself. And that's what it feels like for Kevin Owens. Like he main evented WrestleMania with Steve Austin by default, everything that he will do for the rest of his life will be a downgrade to that. (laughs) So he's just, he's just having, having a good time. And he's just, he's just going to like through sheer force of will has made me mildly invested in, in the Elias Ezekiel shtick. And then, yeah, he's on the, on the raw talk. He's, he's sitting on the floor and, and Kevin and Kevin Patrick comes up to interview him. And Kevin Patrick tries to ask him a question. He's like, I'm not going to look up at you at the whole time. Sit down. <laughs> and he yells at Kevin Patrick until Kevin Patrick squats down next to him. And then yes. later on, yes, Becky's being interviewed and they just, you just hear a noise from off screen. And then Kevin comes out from like behind a, <laughs> case or something and yes and uh and they do they do stick together it's just wonderful yeah. it's, it's just one of those things where when you see him and how great he is at this you're like kevin owens is like one of the most influential wrestlers of his entire generation yeah but like that's but he has the soul of an opening match comedy heel <laughs> and yep. and that's what's really shining through here yep Yep, he uh, also managed to tell Kevin Patrick that uh, he was very handsome and that he had he had gorgeous blue eyes. <laughs> Absolutely tremendous, mm-hmm. tremendous stuff. Uh, Hell in a Cell's happening on on Sunday, and they may add a tag team title match to that to that show with uh, Nakamura and Riddle going against the Usos. But aside from that. Um, Roman Reigns hasn't defended the title since he unified them at WrestleMania, which was uh, we're coming up on two months ago now. Mm-hmm. What are we doing? <laughs> at least like when Brock was champion and didn't defend it, he just wouldn't be on the shows. Roman's still kind of hanging around. There's just not, nobody's booking matches to get him an opponent. <laughs> it's weird, right? <laughs> <laughs> it sure is. Like, obviously, the story was that he was going to be off TV or taking time off or not working, except for these what were supposed to be, you know, the three stadium shows this uh, summer and into the fall. Um, But in the meantime, he's just kind of he's around. (laughs) He's on TV. He's just he's just not really doing anything. And they don't even have like a baby face point out that, hey, he hasn't he hasn't defended these. (laughs) And then you have like, you know, Adam Pierce say, well, Paul Heyman knows a good lawyer and we've we're tied up in legal things and we can't force him to defend the belts or something like all you have to do is say like two lines and you could justify it. But in the meantime, pretty weird. <laughs> yes. I feel like wrestling shows are generally better when there's a championship, a main championship that everyone is striving to win. <laughs> wow. Big, big hot take there. But yes, I, I would be inclined to agree. Yes. So uh, aside from that, uh, Hell in the Cell is coming up on Sunday and the Judgment Day, your favorite act will be in action in a six man tag against Finn Balor, AJ Styles and Liv Morgan. AJ Styles and two geeks are teaming up to take on the Judgment Day. I don't like their chances. Every time they call them the Judgment Day, I feel like they're misspeaking. Like it doesn't sound right. Like I don't know if it's too many syllables or something. 
but it feels like they should be like the judgment or they should be judgment day but the judgment day is specifically their name and how they must constantly be referred to as and it's just real it's just another you know like it's far down the list of things i don't like about this act but it is one that bothers me it's on the list sure that makes sense uh, the United States Championship is up for grabs in a rematch from a match on Raw this past Monday that went one minute and 45 seconds. Theory will be defending the United States title against Mustafa Ali. I don't like Ali's chances. <laughs> you know, like these are your choices when you publicly say that you want to leave the company um, before you secure your release, apparently. Um uh, you either do the POC thing and you sit home for two years <laughs> until yes. you can finally get out of your deal um, or you come back and you take your punishment and you sit and you sit there until your contract actually expires. Yep. He, they let him beat the Miz like in his first match back and they let him beat uh, Champa, I think, by D. De- He's lost like nine matches and won two since he's been back. So that's not <laughs> good. And most of the matches have been under four minutes on mm-hmm. Raw. Mm-hmm. So that's, that's bad times. Ezekiel's wrestling Kevin Owens. Fine little comedy feud for what it is. Mm-hmm. Got no problem with that. Bobby Lashley is wrestling Omos and MVP in a handicap match for some reason. Not sure why. Um, Bianca Belair is defending the Raw women's title against Asuka and Becky Lynch in what should be a really fun match. And Cody Rhodes is wrestling Seth freaking Rollins in Hell in a Cell, which I'm sure will be a very good match. All of these are Raw matches. Nothing for SmackDown on this show. Well, you know, something happened. I don't know who Ronda... I can't remember who Ronda was supposed to wrestle on this show. Um, But yeah, no, they're... (laughs) apparently their decision was uh when when that opponent was no longer available was just to not do that match or and and they looked around and this it's weird how often this happens in wwe huh they something happens somebody gets injured someone leaves or they just they finish a feud and then they're just like they just look around and it's tumbleweeds because they haven't built anyone else up for the champion (laughs) Yeah, Um, because they only push four people and one of those people is off getting married currently. And one of them, I mean, I don't like I guess when Bailey comes back, she can go to SmackDown. But like I like, boy, that's a that is a barren. It's like Shotzi and Aaliyah and they have Natty and Shayna in a tag team. And like, I don't I don't know. It just doesn't they just didn't have anybody for and it doesn't feel like they're going to try to throw anything together at the last minute either. Punting Hell in a Cell is a real weird one to me. Like I wouldn't, I wouldn't punt that show. Mm-hmm. Um, to your, you brought up they, they had three stadium shows scheduled this summer. They had Money in the to an arena when stadium tickets were not selling at a pace that they liked. Uh, they still have SummerSlam in uh, Nashville or wherever that is in uh, Tennessee this summer. And then they have the uh, the Cardiff uh, Stadium show uh, later. But uh, Money in the Bank moved to the smaller venue. I don't know. I guess I guess we'll see how the uh, we'll see how this run a stadium show every month if we can. Uh, strategy by Nick Khan works out. Well, yeah, mixed I think, results so far. Sorry. Yeah, I was I was gonna say I I, I to me that was it, it. I don't think it's a smart. I don't think it's like a great idea. But the idea of like, well, the arena shows are basically televised house shows now, and the stadium shows are our real pay per views. Uh, interesting idea. If in fact you can sell enough seats to justify running a stadium, you know, seven or eight times a year. Eventually, I guess. They would like to do it 12 months a year. I don't think that's going to happen, at least not anytime soon. Um, so it's like, well, are they going to take stuff off that was going to be on that Money in the Bank show because it was a big time stadium show? And now they're going to just 
you know, they're just going to turn that into a house show too. Like, I mean, you still have to do the money in the bank match, I guess on that show, (laughs) but I just like, I don't, I don't know. It's like, it just feels like that was also to me, like they pulled it so quickly. I guess they don't have a lot of faith that like the matches they announced were going to add any tickets, huh? Yeah. Cause like famously, like, much to my chagrin Shane McMahon being added to Wrestlemania in the in the Cowboy Stadium sold a not insignificant amount of tickets yes um, so like they currently were two months out and they had sold however many tickets they, they thought they had sold 17,000 or something and right. they wanted to sell like 30 it's like, right. like if you announce if you did like Roman Reigns versus somebody that the fans cared about <laughs> Could probably could you not get you know nine or ten more thousand people do you not could you not get brock on that show could you not bring like is there no one else you could bring out that you think could sell you that last thirteen thousand tickets or whatever you needed i don't know <laughs> it requires a level of forethought that they just they're not capable of when, yeah. when when the guy who's in charge of the creative shows up at the building every TV taping day and tears the show up, like what do you you know? You can't plan anything like what? Anyway, well, yeah. And again, it's like you could you could even announce like that full card ahead of time and be like, that's why we've been. That's why Roman didn't defend the belt at these these last two shows. Like that could be a and on screens because we've already advertised that he's going to defend the belt against this person on this show in July. So, you know, he's just wrestling six mans or not at all on these next couple of pay-per-views because we've advertised that match. Like you could, that's another way you could, you could justify your weird thing. It's just, I thought it was weird that they gave up so quickly without other than that, they felt like they didn't have a match that was going to move tickets in any significant way. Yes. Uh, I feel like I had something else I wanted to yammer about. Oh, New Japan, uh, Desperado was wrestling Hiromu in the finals of the Best of the Super Juniors. That's like their big junior heavyweight rivalry and like the only two guys in a division that they push. (laughs) So they're going to wrestle for like the eighth time in the last two years, which it's a great match every time. That's fine. Mm -hmm. Both those guys are great, but yeah. And then next next week, Jay White's wrestling Okada for the world title. So there's that. Yeah, so they may be a lot of cheer. They may not be a lot of cheer. Who knows? All right. Is there uh we've uh, we've covered a lot. Is there anything else you want to talk about? No, I think that's there's just there's just so much and <laughs> and it just never stops. We're just in a in a really wild cycle. I guess this is the most interesting non-televised wrestling has been in a while. You know what I mean? Like as far as like backstage stuff. A lot of hot, juicy goss going around right now in, in pro wrestling between the MJF stuff, which kind of it's why it kind of bummed me out when they turned it into an angle, because I was like, well, that's not nearly as fun. <laughs> right. Well, it's clearly not. It's no longer a shoot. It's a work now. Right. Whereas WWE still has two people that walked out of the company and have not come back yet. Right. WWE throwing a temper tantrum and having Michael Cole <laughs> tell us that uh, that Naomi and Sasha let us down for because they didn't uh, adver- they didn't uh, they weren't able to deliver a match they had advertised for about three minutes before they changed it. Uh, right. That that is beautiful and perfect and one of the more interesting pro wrestling moments that's happened in like a decade. Uh, whereas whereas MJF starting out as a sh- as a shoot and then turning it into a work within like three days, eh, not yeah. uh, not nearly as fun. You know what WWE did this past week? So they advertised Lacey Evans returning to the ring on last week's Raw mm-hmm. and for, for this week's Raw. And then Lacey Evans did not, in fact, return to the ring this week on Raw. Oh, she, she must have walked out as well then. I mean, WWE would not would never not deliver like, something. Yeah. yeah, they would never do that. I know a lot of you think. <laughs> that Lacey Don't Evans. blame Conan. <laughs> I'm just doing, yeah, I'm just doing the same shit I always do. But no, that's great. It's all I ever do. <laughs> Don't blame Lacey. Don't blame Lacey Evans for that. But she was at a NASCAR event or something. Maybe that's why. Maybe she was just there and her. caught COVID or something. But I mean, they, they definitely advertised her in ring return and then she was just not on the show. Yep. 
Yep. All right. I suppose that's enough yammering for me. <laughs> Till next time, everyone. I'm Ethan. <laughs> I'm Liam. We'll be back soon with more stories from the wrestling life. Bye bye. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to leave us a five star review on Apple Podcasts. Now, here are this week's bonus features. I forgot she went to a super spreader event. That's right. <laughs> I think that's the sponsor. Cor- that was the coronavirus 600. Let's see. Twins analyst Jim Cott drops a fantasy nickname for Nestor Cortez. Uh oh. <laughs> All right. This is 303. Uh, the beverage of choice this evening is uh, Starbucks Nitro Cold Brew. Dark cocoa sweet cream. Ooh, that sounds alright. I had a monster has a cold brew now that I tried. Which oh yeah. I tried one that was pretty good. I think it was also like sweet cream or something. What's the flavor? And then I had another one which I put in the work fridge on like a Friday and didn't treat drink till a Monday. And the 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 refrigerated one tasted like metal. So I would recommend if you get that one, drink it. Drink it same day. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> the uh Jim Cott, the uh color commentator for the twins, who's 83 years old, called Nestor Cortez Chester the Molester. Sorry, Nestor the Molester. Oh Jesus. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> Nestor the Molester. <laughs> what is it? he molests baseball? Like, what is that even? Like in the context of what would make uh, sense for a baseball name, other than that it rhymes. I suppose that's probably just about it. Cod is a guy <laughs> keep using that, but I don't <laughs> he's um like pretty with it and uh not so much oh what's why we gotta have all these kids running around for being an 83 year old in baseball Mm kind of like palmer and i think he's friends with palmer uh in that in that regard in that they don't really strike you as a fuddy-duddy with a a lot of their takes or anything and then uh and then he uh calls nestor cortez nestor the molester that's bad (laughs) That's pretty bad. I concur that that is bad. I'm willing to say that. I'm willing to be brave enough to to suggest that. All I could think about anytime someone was telling me how brave the troops were on Memorial Day was you, the fact that you are in fact braver than any troop. Many, many people are saying that. Yes. I try to keep on keeping on.